Hello and welcome. This is my wife, Mary, and I'm Ed, and we are Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. We're excited you are joining us today. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School quarterly each week. This is week 13 of the third quarter. All of our videos this quarter deal with the purpose of Christ's first coming. This week we will discuss grace. Last week we went over the way to become righteous. To be made righteous is to be made right. If we are not right, then we are wrong and in need of correction. We must love correction and make the necessary changes both intellectually and spiritually. In this last lesson for the quarter, we will talk about grace and the will. Grace is indeed unmerited favor. It is the unconditional love of God. Just like a parent loves their child without the child doing anything to earn that love, and even with the child being quite a liability, a parent loves their child like crazy. In the same way, the Heavenly Family loves us, and this is what grace is. But salvation doesn't stop there, as we have covered in previous videos this quarter. It starts there, as we will discuss in this video. Most of us are familiar with the scripture in Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Many understand this to mean that no matter what we do, Jesus loves us and saves us unequivocally, just as we are, sins and all. This is a common understanding of grace, kind of like a get-out-of-jail-free card we can present at the pearly gates. This grace, many think, is actuated by faith, which is commonly understood as a belief that Jesus' death on the cross provides for them assurance of salvation while they are still in their sins. This, of course, goes against everything we have talked about this quarter. So let's now take a closer look at grace and learn what Ephesians 2.8 really means. Davidian Seventh-day Adventist prophet Victor Hodiff explains, The unjust, the violators of the law of God, have always, through righteousness by grace, been invited to come into righteousness by faith, the only righteousness that actually receives the reward of Christ's righteousness and of eternal life. Now, says inspiration, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hebrews 10.38 The just, you see, live by faith, but the unjust by grace. Grace, you note, is not the final touch of salvation. Grace plus faith plus the righteousness of Christ are what earn eternal life. Here, Hadif says that the unjust live by grace. Grace is not the final touch of salvation. Wow, this makes a lot of sense. Victor Hadif continues, the law, moreover, does not save, it condemns sin and upholds righteousness. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. Being already a sinner, man is by the law condemned to death. Only by grace, therefore, can he be set free from the condemnation of the law. The sinner, consequently, is a lawbreaker, and the righteous is a law keeper. Grace, therefore, pardons the sinner, lets him out of prison, so to speak, and gives him another chance to overcome sin. But faith keeps him free. The sum of the matter is this. Righteousness through grace is righteousness through pardon, while righteousness through faith is righteousness through behaving, and it is crowned with the righteousness of Christ. To repeat, Victor Hadoff says, grace pardons our sins and sets us free, gives us another chance to make life what it ought to be. Consequently, if you are under grace, you are not under the law, for grace has made you free from the penalty which the law imposes. Okay, that also really makes sense. Sin leads to death. We have all sinned, therefore we should all be condemned to death. It is grace that saves us from eternal death of our past sins, if we through faith take on Christ's righteousness. Ellen White tells us a similar thing regarding the plan of salvation. In the following quote, she tells us about probation. She says, Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well-nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened. His spiritual vision dimmed. He had become subject to death. Yet the race was not left without hope. By infinite love and mercy, the plan of salvation had been devised, and a life of probation was granted to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. Okay, so here we can see that Ellen White shares with us that in order to restore humanity to the image of our maker, 
a life of probation was granted. So grace gives us probation. Davidian Seventh-day Adventist prophet Victor Hadaf explains that like this. Noah lived in an exceedingly wicked world, as you know. It was so wicked that, as merciful as God is, he could no longer contain himself while the wickedness went on. At long last, he commanded Noah to build an ark and promised that all, whether righteous or wicked, who would go into the ark would find deliverance from the awful flood. Since they did not merit such a favor, they were therefore offered deliverance from the flood only through righteousness of grace. They were to be credited with righteousness and given life which they did not merit. Thus we see grace taking occasion to save sinners even back in Noah's day. And so, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans 5.20 So everyone, with no respect to persons, was given grace, unmerited favor, and an opportunity to get on the ark. Both the righteous and the wicked were invited aboard, given another chance. In another example of this, Hadaf says, Later in history came the time that whosoever, good and bad alike, joined the exodus out of Egypt, found deliverance from Pharaoh's taskmasters and from his pursuing army. This deliverance they obtained not because they deserved deliverance, but because of the grace of God towards them. See Ezekiel 20, 1 through 8. Thus they all were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat all the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Yes, through righteousness by grace, none were excluded from participating in the blessings then offered. Having been given righteousness by grace, sufficient to cross the sea, and having come into the desert, they were then given the finest chance to exercise righteousness by faith. But only those who did exercise righteousness by faith lived on and entered the promised land. Those, though, who made no more use of faith in the desert than they did in Egypt perished in the wilderness. Finally came the time for the faithful to possess the land. And so it was that only those whose righteousness by faith sustained them crossed the Jordan. None others did. And for our benefit, the apostle has left this counsel. Let us therefore fear, lest, a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. So here we can see that in order to enter into his rest, we not only need to have the gospel preached to us, grace, but mix it with faith in order to enter in. Remember that faith is trust in what you know to be true according to material reality. It is not blind. We are not commended for believing something dogmatically. Remember that Ellen White told us to have an experimental faith. That is to know something is true based on science, history, and reality. We need to be able to prove to others that what we have faith in is legitimate and give a reason for the hope that we have. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So now let's look again at that verse from Ephesians. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So grace is the first part of salvation, unmerited favor, unconditional love, that then needs to be mixed with faith, which is trust in what we believe. And this leads to righteousness, which is right doing. This we can do through the will, the governing power of man. Ellen White says this about the will. She says the will is the governing power in the nature of man, bringing all the other faculties under its sway. The will is not the taste or the inclination, but it is the deciding power which works in the children of men unto obedience to God or unto disobedience. So our will is our sense of reason. We have faith in what Jesus taught and demonstrated. We trust we can overcome as Jesus taught. Faith is the trusting that we can overcome sin. Will is the decision to overcome each time a temptation comes. And for another Ellen White lesson about the will, she says, The tempted one needs to understand the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or choice. 
Everything depends on the right action of the will. Desires for goodness and purity are right as far as they go, but if we stop there, they avail nothing. Many will go down to ruin while hoping and desiring to overcome their evil propensities. They do not yield the will to God. They do not choose to serve him. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. So here it is stated that your will, which is the soul or the mind, is separate from your body. Now, this is not to say that the soul is a disembodied spirit. Of course, this audience knows that this is not what this verse is referring to by the word soul. It is better defined as the will, the governing power of man. It is your thoughts. That is what you are. That is what you control your body with, your actions by. Your feelings even follow your thoughts held captive by your will. So just thinking out loud, Martin Luther King's body was killed, but his thoughts live on today in our policy and action. Even in his death, his activism lives on today, advancing humanity towards righteousness. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. By doing these things, we will partake in the divine nature. Jesus has it. We can have it too. The divine nature is revealed to us in the mind of Christ. We are to overcome and have the mind of Christ. In closing off the Sabbath School quarter, we wanted to finish with this quote from Ellen White. She says, It is our privilege to be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God has plainly stated that he requires us to be perfect, and because he requires this, he has made provision that we may be partakers of the divine nature. Only thus can we gain success in our striving for eternal life. The power is given by Christ. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, John 1.12. God requires of us conformity to his image. Holiness is the reflection from his people of the bright rays of his glory. But in order to reflect this glory, man must work with God. The heart and mind must be emptied of all that leads to wrong. The word of God must be read and studied with an earnest desire to gain from it spiritual power. The bread of heaven must be eaten and digested, that it may become a part of the life. Thus we gain eternal life. Then is answered the prayer of the Savior, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thank you for staying with us through the entire video. We invite you to visit our website, www.bdsda.com, to learn more about who we are and, just as important, who we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath school studies. God bless. Many blessings.